Welcome to China's Polar Frontiers, a podcast by Sustainable Asia. My name is Marcy Trent Long. In our last season, we visited the depths of the ocean in pursuit of the mineral wealth that could fuel a renewable energy revolution. This time, we're heading to the polar extremes of our planet, the icy expanses of the Arctic and the Antarctic. The 20th century was the age of polar exploration, and superpowers like the United Kingdom, France, and Russia laid claim to parts of the poles. During the second half of the century, organizations were established to maintain peace and order and protect these pristine frozen worlds. But over the last 20 years, new players have asserted their claims on this ice-covered territory, including China. After decades of internal strife and isolationism, China has taken its place as a global leader, driving a hard bargain in negotiations over resource extraction and conservation. Now, with the landscape of the polar regions changing drastically with warming temperatures, China seeks to protect its interests in this new frontier. Why is China so interested in the poles? We begin in Antarctica. On the 7th of November, 2019, China's first homemade icebreaker set off for Antarctica. Shuelang-2, or Snow Dragon-2, will join its Ukrainian-built sister ship, Shuelang, for China's 36th Antarctic scientific research mission. They'll meet at Zhongshan Station in Antarctica, a Chinese research station constructed in 1989 just four years after China's first Antarctic research station, Great Wall. So why all this activity in the Antarctic? And why is China, a country solidly in the Northern Hemisphere, interested in the barren lands of this southernmost continent? That's a question for Dr. Liu Nangye, a senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide, Australia, and a leading authority on China's activities in the polar regions. China is a, is a major player in this world. So I think it's the same question can be asked why the United States is interested in Antarctica or why the European Union is interested in Antarctica. I mean, of course, there are different reasons, but I think they all kind of look at the same thing, which is the future. The future. Antarctica is a land full of resources, China, like any other country with a capacity for long-term planning, knows it needs to be in the room where decisions will be made about these resources. For the Antarctic, that room is managed by the Antarctic Treaty System. The Antarctic Treaty was originally signed in the 1950s by 12 countries who were then active in the Antarctic. The human history of Exploring Antarctica started from the 18th, 19th century, especially during the so-called heroic Antarctic expeditions day era. And this is actually part of the climax of the so-called colonialism that Western powers, they are people from Western countries, they travel around the world trying to look for new territories, resources, and so they go to Africa. So Antarctica is no exception. While for China, in the most part of 20th century, China has been quite inward-looking because uh, China has been through a lot of internal issues, uh, the civil war, the communist revolution, and so all sorts of things, uh, Japanese invasion. So, so for a long time, China has no interest and capacity to get involved issues uh, that are far away, such as Antarctica. So China only started participating in Antarctic affairs in the 1980s. So after the open door, China started reconnecting with the rest of the world. And after 30, 40 years of soaring development, so then the Chinese presence in Antarctica has been also expanding, which is once again reflecting the growing Chinese economy and Chinese interest in the whole world, including Antarctica. The Antarctic Treaty prohibits any military or mining activity in the region, 
but it does allow for the management of the Antarctic fisheries, or so-called marine living resources. Many countries, including China, are eyeing the abundance of marine life in the Antarctic waters. To learn more about the species we can find there, I spoke with Dr. Cassandra Brooks, assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and a member of the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. If you go to the Antarctic Peninsula, you will be on this this vessel and literally there will be whales going by constantly feeding on krill. Um, and that is, you know, humpback whales, minke whales. You'll see orcas um, as well. You'll see heaps and heaps of penguins. Penguins go by um, just jumping out of the water while they're traveling or while they're feeding. You will see um, seals. Seals will both be resting on the ice. Any any ice flows that you see will be will be covered in seals as well as they'll be traveling through the water. And I think for me that was the most surprising thing is that I. I had seen plenty of ocean areas that were rich with life, but to see that Antarctica, where it's literally the coldest, coldest continent, you know, it's the windiest place, it's, um, it's extremely dry on land, and then the water is below the point of freezing, so it's extremely cold, but to know that it's full of life, and animals just have the most amazing adaptations. The fish have antifreeze in their blood. Some of the fish underwater have um, no hemoglobin, so no red blood cells, so their, their, uh, their bodies are, are clear. It's just an absolutely fascinating place to work as a biologist because there's so much life and there's such a diversity of life and abundance of it. One of the central species in this rich ecosystem is krill. To the untrained eye, these look like small shrimp, but they swarm together in massive, dense schools of up to 30,000 per cubic meter. Krill are the key prey species in the Southern Ocean. Almost everything eats krill, so it is a critical um, piece of the of the ecosystem. They're eaten by whales, seals, penguins, squid, you name it. Dr. David Bowden can tell us more. He's a marine ecologist at NIWA, the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, based in New Zealand. Krill is one of the main uh, mesopelagic, so mid-food level organisms in the Antarctic. So in the water column, rather than finding lots of different kinds of fish there, small fish that things prey on, a lot of the biomass is krill, and a lot of the biomass is something called silverfish. So those two organisms between them are a key link in the the trophic web, if you like. So if you go between the the stuff that's happening in, in plankton and the growth of the real base of the food web and the big whales and the the charismatic fauna that we see at the top, the thing that's linking them is the krill and silverfish. So these tiny creatures are critical to the Antarctic food web. But like many marine animals in the frozen world, they're threatened by climate change. Krill have a life history in which their their larval phase, their, their juvenile larval phase, is dependent on sea ice. So they, it's like a nursery under the sea ice. They feed on the, the algae growing under the ice. And then when they're adult, they're free swimming in the water and the ice is, is less of a, an essential habitat for them. But one of the um, scenarios that is quite possible in the future is that as we lose sea ice through the year, it's quite likely that we lose the krill as well. And if we lose the krill, then we lose the higher predators too. So you know, the the daily penguins, the crab eater seals, the whales that are feeding on the krill. It's quite likely, I would say, that we're looking at knock-on effects there as a, a direct consequence of ice loss. The Antarctic is heating up five times faster than the rest of the world, which threatens keystone species like krill and the animals that depend on them. And not just because the water is getting warmer, there's also the other side of global warming, which is the or climate change, is the acidification of the ocean. So as we get more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a lot of that is absorbed into the oceans, and it has the effect of increasing the acidity or reducing the alkalinity of the ocean. And again, where you have organisms in the sea that have evolved under a stable state with certain conditions of pH and that's acidity and temperature, 
if you change both of those things at the same time and potentially quite rapidly, there's, yeah, some would say strong chances that the communities will crash. They will not be able to make the change. Scientists are working hard to get a better picture of the impact of a warmer Antarctic on global ocean currents and the marine food chain. But in the meantime, fishing nations like Norway, South Korea, and China see the large populations of Antarctic krill as an excellent source of feedstock for their fish farms. We spoke about China's coastal overfishing problem in our season three called 1986. Because China's coastal waters are nearly emptied of fish, the country is investing heavily in marine ranching and aquaculture. To feed these farmed fish, they need a lot of protein from either trash fish, the small fry that fishermen can't sell on the market, or they could use krill. Joe Wei of Greenpeace. In the Antarctic, if you look at the number of krill, it seems like that area has not been fully developed yet. So many fishing vessels come to the Antarctic to fish this area. But the way we evaluate whether or not this area is overfished is still done by only looking at that single species. We're not taking into account the entire ecosystem. So if we consider the impact that climate change already has on their habitats, the fishing industry could be adding pressure to the survival of these Antarctic species. Given all these pressures on the Southern Ocean, it's more important than ever to sustainably manage the fishing that goes on there. Fortunately, the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, commonly known as CAMELAR, was put into place in the 80s. We'll talk about that after this short break. We're taking a short break to thank our sponsors and partners. Media X is in Hong Kong cultivating Asia's next generation of media innovators and entrepreneurs. Media X is based out of the Journalism and Media Studies Center at the University of Hong Kong, where Sustainable Asia is recorded. Make sure you check out China Dialogue and China Dialogue Ocean bilingual websites for informative discussions on China and the environment. They're VPN-free in China, have an active WeChat group, and you can also follow them on Twitter. Now back to the podcast. Camelar is an institution that protects marine living resources in Antarctica through fisheries management. That's Julian Chen, a researcher with the Chinese NGO Greenovation Hub. Julian is an observer to the annual Camelar meetings. There are several types of human activities in that part of the ocean. There's the fishing industry, tourism, scientific research, and transport. So the only real extraction happening in the Antarctic is by the fisheries. These have a direct impact on the ecosystem. So the way to protect the Antarctic marine ecosystem is by controlling the fisheries. The Canberra Convention was adopted in 1982 as part of the Antarctic Treaty System. So it is a separate convention which specifically governs Southern Ocean, the fisheries and marine living resources in the Southern Ocean, that the waters adjacent to the Antarctic, Antarctic continent. It's 24 nations plus the European Union that govern the Southern Ocean. And it's an amazing convention. Camelar is just such an amazing convention from a fisheries management perspective. It's very much an ecosystem convention. It very much is a conservation convention. It demands that any fishing has to be done in such a way that it doesn't damage the ecosystem, that it doesn't damage predator or prey species, that there must be this ecosystem consideration and conservation consideration when we fish. So when China joined Camelar in 2007, they agreed that the convention applies to all fishing in the Southern Ocean. Matt Pinkerton, a colleague of David Bowden at New Zealand's Niwa Research Center. Camelar has got three parts to their principles of conservation. The first part is not to collapse the stock that you're fishing. The second part is to protect other species in the system that are connected to the species you're fishing. And the third part is to ensure sustainability and, and reversibility of any effects of fishing in 20 to 30 years. Camelar thus is considered a leader in how to do ecosystem-based management. 
And so they do allow for fishing. However, countries must apply to fish. They must basically put in a notification and then that notification has to be approved by that 25 member commission. And they make decisions based on consensus. So basically all the countries have to agree that this fishery should move forward. Otherwise it doesn't. And I think that's largely what has limited fisheries thus far in the convention area is that it really, countries again must show that that they're not, or at least that's what's written in the law, that countries must show that they're not going to harm the environment in carrying out these fisheries. Frida Bankton of Greenpeace is also an observer at Camelot. So within the scientific committee of Camelot, sort of there is working groups that looks at different issues. And for example, if you look at krill fishing, that scientific committee gives advice based on the total biomass and sort of trigger levels and how much that can overall be fished. And then it's up to the member states to notify their fishing interests and the boats that will be taking part in, in a certain fishery. And as in any fishery, whatever they catch will be reported into the Camelot Secretariat. And if certain trigger levels are met in certain areas, those areas will be closed for further fishing. Camelar has always functioned as a monitoring convention, handing out licenses to fishing nations according to what can be sustainably caught. But in recent years, the scientific committee has encouraged another tool for sustainable fishing. Their convention has a clause that allows for closed areas for the purposes of conservation or science. As Cassandra Brooks mentions, Camelar also has the power to close off sections of the ocean, and end all fishing in that area for a certain period of time. These are what's known as Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs. And so Marine Protected Areas are within their legal toolbox. They weren't largely talked about within the Kemlar community until the late 90s and even early 2000s. And the reason they started really being talked about was there was increasing science pointing towards Marine Protected Areas being this powerful biodiversity conservation tool. With climate change threatening to disrupt the ecosystems of the Antarctic, many Western conservationists are calling for more generous use of these no-take zones. I've worked a lot on marine protected areas in the Antarctic, and they are an amazing biodiversity tool. There are hundreds of studies that show this, that they cause increases in biomass, they cause increases in genetic diversity, that they actually can even bolster fisheries because they provide this spillover effect. This spillover effect happens when marine protected areas shield fish populations so they grow bigger and more numerous. And fishermen who trawl next to a protected area can often catch additional and bigger fish. That's not the only motivation for setting up MPAs, according to Matt Pinkerton. For instance, in some parts of the Antarctic, fishing for toothfish happens on long lines. And as the fish come up on the long lines, there are killer whales and sperm whales that have learned to take toothfish off the fishing line. So this obviously is bad for the fishing, and it, and it also contravenes Camelot's principle of conservation. So one of the strong arguments for an MPA is that you, you should separate where the killer whales are foraging and where the fishing is operating to try and stop that behaviour occurring. Another part is to just understand the system. So we take in particular areas that we think of important ecosystem processes, and we use the MPA to give us an opportunity to study the effects of climate change on the organisms in that area compared to areas where there is fishing occurring. And so there's just so much work that shows that that they're very effective at conserving the ecosystem. Beyond that, in the face of environmental change, and we are seeing rapid environmental change across the world, but especially at the poles, we are seeing that protected areas can actually be this tool for enhancing the resilience of the system. So obviously you can't expect that a protected area will stop climate change. That's not going to happen at all. We need we need global governments to to do more to stop climate change. But marine protected areas can bolster the system and, and make them more resilient to climate change. Camelar adopted the first marine protected area in 2009. This area of almost 100,000 square kilometers lies just off the South Orkney Islands, near the southern tip of South America. But the biggest success for conservationists so far has been the establishment of the Ross Sea MPA in 2016. This is an area of 1.5 million square kilometers, about half the size of India, 
in the Bay of the Ross Sea, a part of Antarctica closest to New Zealand. But this huge MPA almost didn't make it past the unanimous vote required by Camelar. Two countries kept vetoing the idea, Russia and China. As the newest member of Camelar, why was China so against this MPA? I think Chinese position on uh, Southern Ocean MPA is, is quite consistent and uh, clear. China thinks that Kamala is doing very well uh, in its job, and there is no further need to introduce no-take MPA, which means commercial fishing will be completely banned. As Liu Nangye says, the Chinese delegation believes the Kamalar system of licensing and monitoring works just fine. And they may be right. Krill stocks in the Kamalar area have increased in the past 20 years. But this could also be the result of the species concentrating in the colder waters close to shore, as climate change heats up their farther afield habitats. The system of licensing and monitoring is referred to as sustainable or rational use. But while China believes this works well, conservationists like Frida Bengtsson of Greenpeace believe climate change alters everything. I think if we are going to sustainably kind of manage our oceans and, and let the oceans cope with the impacts of climate change and sort of have resilience, we need to set larger areas of ocean aside. You can't have sustainable use for resource extraction of marine resources if you don't have protection on the other side. Like, that has to go hand in hand. But at the moment, it's a very sort of single-handed approach where we think that we can, can fish our way into sort of a sustainable ocean's governance or we just have to manage what's in the ocean and we will be fine. So um, the rational use piece that, that China and other countries point to to defend a sort of right to fish is not an accurate representation of what the Kamler Convention says. The Kamler Convention talks about conservation being the mandate, but that conservation can include rational use. And rational use is defined as, yes, you can fish, but you must fish with the following responsibilities. And that points back to that you can fish, but you have to consider impacts on the ecosystem, that you cannot cause damage to the ecosystem that's not reversible within 20 to 30 years. And that's exactly what the language is. And so it's being sort of reinterpreted as this right to fish, but it is absolutely not written that way. And I've even done many uh, research interviews with people who helped craft the Kamlar Convention who wrote that description of rational use, and it absolutely was not designed as a right to fish. But as any <laughs> legal system, people come and interpret the law differently. And so I think that that is part of what's happening right now. China is the newest uh, member to Camelar, and they have every right to be there and to be in the room, but only to point out that they were one of the countries that weren't there for crafting the convention or even for those early discussions on marine protected areas. And so perhaps there is an element that the other Camelar members have a responsibility to engage better with China and any other countries that come on board to give a sense of that history and that responsibility that comes with being a member. And that may be the key to differences of opinion. As China is relatively new to the Antarctic, they weren't present when the rules were drafted. By the time they gained an interest in the Antarctic fishery stocks, other countries had already decided what could be fished and where. So China arrived at Camelar with very different expectations. When China joined this committee, its main incentive was the interest in fisheries, because krill is a large source of protein. That is its strategic interest. So China wants to be able to control and develop this resource. China joined this organization on the request of its fisheries department. So when you understand their intention, it's easy to understand that the establishment of no-take zones goes against their approach. These different interpretations of what Camelar is meant to do came to a head again at this year's Camelar meeting in late October 2019. On the table for the eighth year in a row was the proposal for a string of MPAs in the East Antarctic, facing the Indian Ocean. These would protect penguin foraging grounds 
and give scientists the space to study the ocean currents that flow out from these cold waters. Another proposal would set up an MPA in the Weddell Sea near the southern tip of Chile. Both these proposals failed again, partly because of opposition from China. But Liu Nangye says we shouldn't only look at the headlines blaming China for a stalemate in these negotiations. If you see this MPA negotiation as a process, it is disappointing, I think, from the environmental perspective that it was not approved. But if you see it uh, holistically, I think the steps are made every few years. I would predict that China will support those MPA proposals like what they did uh, in the Rossi MPA negotiations. But it, it takes time. And also, there will be different kind of compromise that will have to be made in those negotiations. So what possible compromise is China looking for? One of the suggestions is to limit the duration of these MPAs. We're already seeing sort of that desire uh, being offered to countries that might want just a limited duration to protect their ability to fish in the future. So that's already on the table. And I would think that would be attractive to countries like China that are forward thinking. The Ross Sea MPA was originally proposed as a permanent MPA, but under pressure in part from China, it was renegotiated and limited to a 35-year duration. For other MPA proposals, setting a limited time frame is also part of the discussion. So that could be a compromise between conservation groups and those who support rational use. And according to marine scientist Matt Pinkerton, This makes scientific sense, too. There's also a science argument for having constant review of MPAs because climate change is certainly happening. We see changes to patterns in the Southern Ocean that are going to have flow-on effects in the ecosystems. So if you set up a protected area and you don't have any capacity to change the boundaries of that, as knowledge improves or as climate change affects the system, then that might not be a sensible thing to do. It might be better to give yourself the flexibility of, of having an MPA which can adjust to changes of knowledge and changes of the, of the climate and the ecosystems down there. Another reason why China has been reluctant to sign off on any new MPAs is because they claim more work needs to be put into a detailed monitoring plan so we can actually know what impact the MPA has on the ecosystem. So at the Camelar meeting earlier this year, China did not agree to a new protected area, but instead proposed a stronger research and monitoring plan. The Chinese delegation submitted seven working papers to the meeting. Three of them are regarding the research and monitoring plan in the Rossi MPA and also for Camelar MPAs in general. So even though no MPA proposal was approved, I think the discussion could be very constructive and also interesting because the opposition of the MPAs, at least as far as I can tell from the Chinese delegation, are very much legitimate. The Rossi MPA, which is already approved and entered into force in 2017, should have a very detailed baseline data for marine ecosystem in the MPA. and then a very good uh, management plan for the MPA. Rather than adding new marine protected areas so we can achieve global conservation targets, China argues that we should increase our capacity to monitor existing areas, to make full use of the data these protected areas can provide. Scientists like David Bowden, who go on regular expeditions to the Ross Sea, already have their work cut out for them, when it comes to monitoring such a vast area of the ocean. We've got to find things that we can monitor, that we can go back year after year, go and measure the same things, and then be able to do the science, crunch the numbers and say, yep, this is what's happened since we established the marine protected area. And when you consider the size of the MPA, that's quite a tall order. But David believes that with enough manpower and time, these MPAs will be able to serve their purpose and increase our knowledge of this vulnerable underwater world. I think the the Rossi Marine Protected Area is a a superb testament to what um, the the global community can do when it puts its mind to it. 
And uh, it's it's our job as scientists now to um, demonstrate the worth of it and to let it tell its story about what is happening with the world. Looking ahead to next year's Camelar, Liu Nangye thinks it's very likely China will agree to the MPA in the East Antarctic. So next year will be a very good timing, that especially uh, the Convention on the Biological Diversity uh, will have its first COP conference of parties uh, meeting in China. So that would be a very good timing for the EU and Australia to in- persuade China to support this their MPA proposal in in East Antarctica. Uh, so I think progress will be made next year. But oh, that's my prediction. But I think we should really look this MPA negotiation as a dynamic process rather than just taking the approval of the MPA from a very pessimistic geopolitical angle, which will not be that helpful. The ongoing negotiations over marine protected areas in the Antarctic tell us a lot about how China and the world look at issues of conservation and sustainability. We're fortunate to have an international organization like Camelar where these worldviews can come to a respectful and productive consensus. Camelar is a, a kind of perfect example of where science and politics kind of come together. It's got a very good history of listening to the scientists and taking the scientists' views on board. It's a very science-centered organization, much better than many others around the world. But there's definitely geopolitical tensions playing out through it as well. But it's nice that science is the currency of communication in Kamala. So there is a, a strong rational basis for most of the decisions that are made. And the dialogue is very respectful which is a a really positive model, I think, for other fisheries management around the world. In the Antarctic, the 12 countries that originally signed the Antarctic Treaty agreed on a vision of sustainability and conservation that's now being questioned by some members like China. Climate change drives an urgent need for a better understanding of our polar waters. And while large marine protected areas can improve the resiliency of threatened species, different countries are subject to their own domestic agendas. As long as science remains the currency of communication at Camelar, it can provide an example for sustainable progress throughout the world. The Antarctic is a global common, a neutral land surrounded by ocean. What happens when many of these same nations meet on the other side of the globe? The Arctic, a largely frozen ocean surrounded by sovereign land, is threatened by the same effects of climate change. But this isn't a shared space where treaties and conventions can hand out fishing licenses. This is a highly contested area and a hotspot for territorial disputes. What is China's ambition in the Arctic? Next, in part two of China's Polar Frontiers. China's Polar Frontiers is hosted by me, Marcy Trent Long, and produced by Sam Columby in collaboration with China Dialogue. The series is mixed by Chris Wood. Thanks to all our guests for helping us unravel this complicated issue. And to Dr. Tang Jianye, Dr. Richard Steiner, Dr. Rasmus Bertelson, Margot Stiles, Kim Yansik, Dr. Candice Newman, and Dr. Alf Hakan Hall, whose voices didn't make it on this podcast, but whose interviews were crucial to our understanding of this topic. Thanks to Matt Walsh and Jill Baxter for their voiceover, and Alexander Mobison for his intro-outro music made from repurposed and recovered waste items. Additional thanks to Mark Roberts for his Arctic Sound recordings, and to the entire Sustainable Asia team, Bonnie and Heidi Au, Josie Chan, and Crystal Wu, we couldn't do it without you. Mm-hmm.